Welcome to episode 14 of Dial the Gate. My name is David Reed. Thank you so much for joining me. I took last week off for Halloween, and I appreciate those of you who showed up anyway for the live shows with Rob Cooper and Andy Frizzell. It was interesting to see what would happen uh, while there was no technical uh, live stream with the show, but we had uh, new recordings anyway. And it was I was surprised to see how down the numbers were compared to otherwise. Um, so I, I'm going to continue to try and do as many live shows as I can. Just got to take a weekend off here or there, otherwise I'll go insane. Before I bring in Mr. Colin Cunningham, I want to go and get some uh, housekeeping out of the way here. Before we get started, if you like Stargate and want to see more content like this on YouTube, it would mean a great deal to me if you click that like button. It really makes a difference with YouTube's algorithm and will definitely help the show grow its audience. And please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon. Giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops and you'll get my notifications of any last minute guest changes. This is key if you plan on watching live and clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next several days on both the Dial the Gate and GateWorld.net uh, YouTube channels. I have definitely been behind on this, but you know what? This week's a new week, and I'm hoping to get that up to speed. So without further ado, I'd like to bring in the guest of the hour, Mr. Colin Cunningham. Hello, sir. How are you? It's good to see you. It's good to see you. Major Paul David. You think after 10 years, you think we would have gotten that guy a promotion? You know, I'm curious though. It, did it ever officially become Paul? Yes, Paul was. Yeah, it did. In a matter of time, it was. It was one of your first words. No, no that's right. Because I'll tell you, that was that was purely a fan thing, man. Because he had no, there was no first name. It was just Major Davis. Are you sure about and that? Then, yeah, no, there was never. And I believe, I swear to God, um, sometimes they say that you know you hear because for legal purposes, the the, the big wigs at MGM are the writers and stuff, they can't say that they're on there, uh, you know, reading the fan stuff and all that kind of stuff. But it's obviously they, they glean some inspiration, you know, and, and Paul Davis, I think, was one of the names that was bandied about by the fans. Really? They, yeah, yeah, yeah. I could have swore, you know, that it was um, interesting. I could have swore that that was his first name in a matter of time. And I guess it wasn't. I just went there and looked. And it's you not may the be case. Right, I don't think so. Yeah, I really don't think huh. so. Well, bonus points to anyone in the uh, listening audience who can uh, figure out which episode. It is, it is, yeah, it was put into a script. I thought it was put in a matter of time, and it clearly wasn't. So, But, yeah, maybe it was a fan um, suggestion. I'm almost positive that's how it – but years have gone on, and our memories are getting a little dusty as we go. You know. A little <laughs> – I can barely remember <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> so how are you? How are things I'm going? Well. I'm doing – I'm doing well, man. I'm 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 staying positive and healthy and optimistic, and uh, and it's all good, man. It's 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 uh it's great to be alive. Uh, what are you working on right now? You've been working busy on a, a stage production. Yeah, I'm t oh god, it's just so nice to get back on the boards again because I started as a stage actor, and um and and but the one thing that had always eluded me, I mean, I've been incredibly blessed. As you know, I mean, I've worked with some pretty awesome people. I really, really have. I cannot complain. But the one thing I've never done is a musical. I've never done one. I've never done one. I've done, yeah, I've done tons of theater. I've done, you know, you name it, every genre, Western, sci-fi, horror, blah, 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 blah. But I've never done a musical. And I'm always very envious of, of actors that do, that sing and dance and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, long story short, so where I'm living right now, I'm in St. George, Utah. And pretty place. I ought yeah, and it's beautiful. And I'm, I auditioned for Oliver, the, the stage production musical of Oliver. And I learned very quickly that uh, during the audition, I cannot dance, man. You know what? I think I could. I could if I had enough time. But I mean, on audition day, and it was so weird. It was, it was, it was wonderfully humbling uh, slash humiliating because here I'm auditioning and I've got two left feet, man. And people are looking over saying, that guy looks a lot like Major Davis, you know, or isn't that, isn't that, isn't that John Pope from Falling Skies, you know, oh, God. Dan doing, dancing with everybody else. And, um, but it was weird. It was kind of, it was kind of fun in that people, people didn't recognize me because it was just the last place you'd ever expect 
you know what I mean? It's context. It's always context. Anyway, so I auditioned and I got the part and I'm absolutely blessed uh, to have it. I'm super excited. Who are you? And I'm, I'm playing Mr. Sourberry and Bill Sykes. So I'm, uh, I'm playing these incredibly iconic, well, Bill Sykes is certainly a legendary iconic character from the Dickens novel and of course the David Lean film and then the Carol Reed musical. And, uh, and I'm loving it, man. So we go up, not this coming Thursday, but the following Thursday, November 19th, I believe it is. Anyway, so I'm super pumped. So I'm working. It's like amazing. Um, yeah. it's, it's really nice in that here in Utah, anyway, they've not that they've adopted any particular model, but they're looking more at the for the COVID crap anyway. They're looking at more like Sweden and stuff like that. So people are being safe and respectful, but it's not like you won't be arrested if you're out on a surfboard in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. You know what I mean? So right. there's a there's a bit of common sense approach to just living. And I don't want to call it normal, but it's it's pretty close. It's close enough not to go insane. So I'm blessed to be in Utah and I'm blessed to be, have been hired to work on this show. And, um, and yeah, and it's a Christmas show. So we, we, we go up in another couple of weeks. I'm really excited about it. Well, fantastic. Good for you. How long is it running? Uh, I think we're going to run until December 23rd. Okay. Wow. And I'm assuming that there's going to be limited seating available. That's how they're going to get a, get around that. Yeah, I expect it's in the round. Yeah, I'm not sure if they're going to do um, the social distancing or just wear a mask and then you can sit anywhere and everywhere. But okay. um, I think we're going to be sold out for a good good part, if not all of the run. So I'm looking forward to it. It'll be, it's just great to be back on stage again. Exactly. And I am singing. I'm not doing any dancing, which was smart on their part. But uh, <laughs> but it's great. I mean, it's Dickens, man. And it's it's London, 1850. And it's dark. And there's love and intrigue and murder and singing and dancing so I'm, I'm i'm excited well good for you that's fantastic uh does stargate's lasting popularity um surprise you that we're still talking about this thing we talked you and i caught up a little bit a couple months back for GateCon for the 20th anniversary you were in that round table discussion online this thing just doesn't go away and it just keeps on sprouting new viewers online. There's brand new people discovering this thing in all the social media message boards constantly. Well, I'm, I'm so happy to hear that. Look, I've given two opposing answers for that, for that. Am I surprised? Uh, no. Um, and then, but, but you're asking me now and yes, I am. Uh, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll qualify that by saying when, when you start doing a show, that's, look, you hope it's going to be great. You're, you're doing everything you can to make it great. You hope it's going to be able to su sustain. But the fact is, they don't. Um, they truly often don't. I will say the, the, the blessing in sci-fi is that it often, it's, it's kind of, it can be the exception to that particular rule. But things get old. They get dated. You know, special effects get, get all the more sophisticated. And, you know, what was eye-popping five, 10 years ago looks like, you know, cardboard cutouts with today's technology. But I think the staying power uh, for sure is just, is it comes, it always comes down to the content. I, it really, really does. It comes down to the scripts. It comes down to the, to the casting, I'm not talking about the acting per se, but the casting, they really did an exceptional job putting those pieces together. And they're all wonderful actors in their own right, but they, they also hired the right wonderful actors. And, and I think that's what continues to resonate. I, I, in so many years, if not already, I mean, technology's advanced and special effects now and the visual effects now are, are insane. But, but I think hopefully what holds uh, Stargate's appeal is, is this, the universal wow. The, 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 it, it never pandered. It never talked down to its audience. I mean, you'd have to take a leap of faith. Okay, fine. That, that comes with anything. And you're tuning in to give up an, an hour of your evening or, or, or your day. So it's escapism, but it it doesn't have to be stupid. In, in Stargate, it, it never was, or at least it never, it never, it never took the shortcut. It was like, hey, look, if we can make it better, how can we make it better? And that was across the board, man. It really, really was from 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 the writers to, 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 to Peter Deloise and all the directors mm. that, that got together. And you'd see them and as much, look, it was fun and everybody was joking, we're having fun on set, but there are also moments, okay, well just, how can we make it better? If, if, we, if we took another 
few minutes. Okay, it might be 10, 15 minutes. And man, when the clock's running, that's money. But, but got to be so much better. We can just take this 10 minutes and let's just, okay, and then you got it. Okay, great. And now it's forever more. So, and you, I, I don't, so I'm, but I'm still surprised. Yes, I'm still surprised. I don't know what it is, man. If, if anything, you could probably answer that question better than me because you, you've asked the question and gotten so many different answers. But there's no wrong answer. So that's the Fair thing. Enough. I mean, you know, it's 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 contemporary. You've got um, people that are far more relatable than people that are in the future from a society where every every thing is now solved and they don't deal with the things that we deal with, you know. And it's, uh, but I think the thing that continually resonates with me and a lot of the people that I talk with is that it's topical. Is that you know we can we can continually go back and find something that we're currently dealing with socially, politically, economically, one of all of, you know, all of those things put together. And uh, it's it continues to resonate because it's humanist at its yeah, core. Yeah, well, I think there's that, there's that, um, how do we fix this problem? How do we get these, these, these heads together that are all different? and and try and figure out the answer to this problem and it, look and it's 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 pure drama it's wonderful it's fantastic it's it it goes back far further than stargate but i mean you look at a movie like uh, apollo 13 you yeah. know what i mean it's it's this massive problem and they're coming out with pencils and paper to figure it out now that's riveting that's riveting it's not they're not getting the answer from an algorithm or, or from just talking into the air hey alexa how do we fix this problem? They've got pencils and paper, and and you've got you know uh, you know Carter, and you've got these these incredible characters that that they're they're using their brains, you know, or at least as much as as much as within the story and all that kind right. of stuff. So I don't know. Maybe that has something to do with it. Maybe it doesn't. That and everybody was gorgeous, drop dead gorgeous. But uh, not me, not Major Davis, not so much. But I, I, don't I know. you look man. pretty good in uniform. You know, I'll I'll tell you, I, the thing that does surprise me. The thing that surprises me in terms of, wow, that it's lasted this long. The show went 10 years before it, it stopped. <laughs> That's a miracle in itself, man. Shows don't do that. Certainly not a show like Stargate, where you're constantly reinventing and constantly, you can't keep something fresh for 10 friggin' years. So I think it's that's the two say miracles of Stargate is the fact that they were able to pull it off for a year and then another, and then another, and then another all the way to 10. Mm. And, and then, and then the, the fact is how long has it been now? Is it 20 years? What's the exact number since it stopped? Uh, 2008 was, yeah. So 2000, yeah. So 2008 was when, uh, everything wrapped. So it's been 20 and, and the, and the first episode, you know, 1997. Ago, so, that's, crazy. that's incredible. But hey, you know what? But I've been a little bit out of the loop, I have to admit. So when you're telling me that it's the show's being rediscovered online by a new generation, right. um, that that's cool, man. That's very, very cool. Because I will say uh, the new generations, they don't care about anything other than their thumb and where it's going. So mm -hmm. if it is, this is a tough market to be picking up an audience, man. That's you know true. what I mean? These generation, whatever the friggin' letter we're up to now, you know, it's a, they're, they're, they're tough. <laughs> I think it, I think it speaks hope to um, uh, the generations that are coming because there, there, there are still people out there, young people who are curious and inquisitive and and don't think that they have it all totally. together and and are looking for uh, a, an ideal standard to live up to. And I think the Stargate is one of those things that offers that. No, you're absolutely right. If, if anything. And it really is a metaphor, a, a, a seed for you get is as screwed up and as messed up the world is or that we think it is. There's still some. There's still some 10 year old girl that's that's walking out onto a onto her dad or her mom's farmer's field in Kansas, staring up at the sky and thinking, I got a shot, a legitimate shot of going there. Yeah. And. And that's amazing. And in, in the middle of all the chaos, somebody says, I want to go to Mars. And that's where their focus is. Or I want to do this, or I want to do that. Or I want to invent something 
great. You know, I mean, I don't know. When I was five, I got a big wheel. You know, I mean, today, five-year-olds are getting 3D printers. You know what I mean? So it's just, <laughs> it's, uh, it's amazing. So I don't know. I, I think, I certainly think as, as, as ominous as things might feel from time to time, there's a lot of light out there. There's a lot of hope and there's a lot of, uh, uh, sparks that are that are ready to ignite and go out into the into the universe and into the world and 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 take it take it further man than you and i ever could you know this is true i want to go back to your origins uh as an actor tell me about colin cunningham as a young man where is he from what were his what were his goals man that's a that's an injury. I'm trying to think, of, you know, which Colin Cunningham do I want to talk about? Um, the one that led to to Davis and the one that led to being a guidance counselor for at risk teens. And um, well, I'll, look, I'll, led I'll to tell this you, extraordinary man that I've that I call my friend. I'll tell you I'll tell you a story, a story I don't tell. Um, basically. My childhood was a little interesting. Great family, everybody loved and supported. Nobody, thank God, was an alcoholic or beating anybody up. But uh, from the time I was about six months old, I had full blown atopical eczema from my neck all the way down. And the first, and it was bad, man. I'm, so I was in and out of hospitals, in and out of doctor's offices, I mean, constantly and incredibly self-conscious about it. So for the first 13, 12 and a half years of my life, I wore a turtleneck, long sleeve shirts, long pants. And this is in North Hollywood, all right? This is in grew up, growing up in Van Nuys and Los Feliz in Southern California, where the temperatures can hit 103, 104, 105. And I always wore a turtleneck, long sleeve shirts and long pants. And I never even went into the ocean until I was 13 because the salt in, in the ocean would yeah. be, it'd be like iodine in a cut. Anyway, so I spent a good 10, 12 years in and out of doctors and all that kind of stuff. And, and the doctors always said, once, you turn, once he hits puberty, his whole system's going to change and it's just going to go away. And sure enough, one day, it all just went away. And... And then I be got into other things, became a teenager, you discover girls, you're in school and all this kind of stuff, you know? And it wasn't until, I guess I was about 23, 24, that I was just feeling like a, well, I got like a fish out of water. I didn't feel like I quite fit in. I had friends, I was happy, I wasn't doing anything stupid and I was just, but I just didn't feel connected. I always felt like I was in a crowd and on my own. And it was funny, it was a friend of mine um, who said, well, like, what about your parents? And I'm like, no, oh, man, like, like I said, nobody's an alcoholic. I never got beat. She says, was there anything that made you different as a kid? And I was like, no, I was a normal kid. I had a bike. It all came back. It was a trip. <laughs> anyway, so I just it flooded back and I was like, holy shit. Like, fuck man, you know? And then just all this imagery came flooding back in of, oh God, it, it's just so crazy. I'm actually, I'm, it's, it's a great story to tell, but these images would flood back in of this little kid who had to go on a school field trip to the pool, to the local swimming pool. Yeah. And I would also, I would rip my skin to shreds, David, with my fingernails, because I was itching all the time. And I'd be, I'd be just stripped. I'd strip myself. And I'd go into my mom's room in the middle of the night, and she would run a hot bath for me. And I'd get into the bath. And at the end of the bath, when I got out of it, it was pink. It was crimson, for God's sake. And I remember my mom... I could hear the sound of her tearing sheets in the in the hallway. She'd go to the Salvation Army and buy these cheap sheets, and she'd tear them up into bandages, and she'd wrap me up like a like a friggin' mummy. Aww. So I was, dude, I was Boris Karloff for the first twelve years of my life, you know. And it was a a trip. And when I got hot, 
when things got hot, you know, you're playing basketball, whatever, you'd start to unravel. And then you got to make sure kids don't see anything. So I'm tucking the, all the, these bandages in, 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 in and away and, and then going to a school field trips and then having to find a corner to un, be the last person on the bus to unravel yourself so that yeah. nobody catches you and all this stuff. Anyway, all that said, um, I, I guess I discovered acting it was on a dare and it was just completely different. And I guess I wasn't afraid of, I could, I could hide within this, whatever, whatever walls you build up for yourself. And I was able to, to, to take that feeling of, of not being connected and, and use it, or at least use it as a tool. So discovered acting, wanted to start acting, wanted to start expressing and doing all this kind of stuff. And, and so I did. So I began to per pursue this wonderful craft. I won't call it an art form of, of, of acting and directing and producing and writing. And just this whole creative process just really came as a, as a, as an escape to me because I, I didn't quite fit in in school and I wasn't the best student. I was always sketching or, or doing mm. flip books, making little movies, you know, and, and dictionaries <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. So that was, that was in many ways, my fantasy outlet. So I really got into the movies and I really got into actors and I really got into this, these, these genres and these iconic television programs that I grew up with because I was kind of a latchkey kid sitting home watching TV, you know? And um, so I don't know if that, well, of course it shapes you, you know? I mean, and, and I think every decade that passes since you, 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 your world is colored all the more from it. You know, and you see, oh my God, this, this colored my life in that way, that colored my life in, in this way. And there's not really nothing unique about it. Everybody goes through it. Everybody's got some kind of something that made them different. And, and they were different. You're all different. We're all different. There's no, we're all the same. No, you're all individual, sovereign, independent, human beings with your own voice and your own form of expression. Um, I've never been one to divide people up into things because there's not enough divisions. It's infinite, absolutely infinite. So I don't know, at the end of the day, man, I think the person standing in, 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 in their shoes, that's, that's the ultimate I don't want to say minority, but, but that's it. You're, you're you. And there's only one of you mm -hmm. and uh, figure it out as best you can do what you got to do. Work as hard as you can to get where you want to get. If you get tired and exhausted, go to your corner, man, take a breath, you know, but then you get back out there and you, you hit it again. Cause it, it's a journey. It's really, really a journey. So yeah. So there's me and my childhood. Geez, you, where, where'd you come? Never told that story. And obviously why, but uh Holy crap, man. I can't believe you got that out of me. That's well, crazy. I, I appreciate you sharing it. I mean, the, the I, I've had the pleasure of knowing you for well over 10 years now, and there's always been something. I mean, I use the word constitution in the text message that I sent you earlier today. You have always been someone whose constitution I have admired. And, you know, it 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 comes it has to come from a place where you have adversity and you either overcome it or you don't. And it sounds like that young man did. Uh, who are your heroes? Both whom you know personally and um, who you also watched and studied. Who helped to shape you into the person you are? Well, look, I mean, naturally we think of our families. I think of my mother and my father. You know, they grew up in, well, the bombs were, not Nazi Germany was bombing uh, Northern Ireland and England and they're, they're from Belfast. So they grew up in the rubble of all that crap. And there was no money. My mom used to, used to tell us that when she was uh, like 12 and 13, they couldn't afford stockings. So you'd take a ballpoint pen and you'd run it up the back of your leg, right? So that's, that's humble beginnings. Today, you know, everybody's walking around in $800 Nikes and $1,200 cell phones. So it's just a completely different world. Yeah. But uh, so, yeah, I think, I think your parents in, instill that whatever that is uh in you a lot of look my for me it was never the words that shaped my youth were rarely um 
what am I, what's, what were the words I'm searching for? Just, just anything related to, to self. It wasn't self-esteem. It wasn't how you feel. Uh, it wasn't that kind of stuff. It was words like integrity, character, dignity, uh, honor, uh, um, contribution, um, community, you know, and, and respect and all that kind of stuff. You often came last mm. on that list, you know? So, so that's, that's, I, I think that's a, a wonderful thing, you know, uh, in terms of just, just strength of try not to be a liability to anyone, you know what I mean? Very, very JFK, you know, think not of what, you know, your country, country can, can do, do for you, you. think yeah. of what you can do for your country kind of, kind of thing, but also as relates to family and as it relates, as it relates to the planet earth, you know? Um, so there's a little bit of that, but I think growing up, many of my heroes were, uh, you know, all the, all the, the actors that, the, in the old black and white movies, man, you know, from James Cagney to look, all, all the ones I gravitated towards were all the actor actors, the Alec Guinnesses and the, uh, the, you know, Peter Laurie and the, the Lon Chaney and, and these, in, just these incredible actors that would completely change from one, one gig to the next. Uh, I mean, I, I, it's amazing that we're doing Oliver right now. And I think, God, I think Alec Guinness was like 30, maybe 29, 31 when he, when he played Fagan. I'm probably yeah, wrong Fagan. about that, right? But he certainly wasn't 60 or 50 for that matter. So uh, anyway, so just, just actors that are able to shape shift and, 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 and really get into that world. It's, 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 it's an awesome place to be. I, I never wanted to be uh, an actor because it was cool to do or because you'd, you'd get the girls or because you'd get a nice table at the restaurant. It was more, it was, you get to do that. You get to disappear. You know, you get to, uh, to, to, to explore that, that world, you know, but when I'm done with it, it's, it's, I'm always a little weirded out when, when someone recognizes me, like I said, I mean, it's, <laughs> I should be auditioning for Oliver and trying to dance. And instead it's like, Hey, aren't you major Davis? You know, so <laughs> that really happened to a, you in Utah. It's a, it's a weird, it's a weird thing, but it takes you out. Yeah. It just it takes, it takes you out, you know? So, so it's, it's weird to constantly be aware of the fact that you may be monitored. You may be, you, you may be being watched or however the hell you phrase it. Or maybe, you know, uh, people know that you come <laughs> from quality stock and they're expecting, you know, something great from you too, at the same time. Well, that's another thing. You have to so, be nice to people. Yeah. And not that, that, not that that's bad. That's a great thing. But sometimes you don't want to be, man. You're that's having true. a crappy ass day. You're miserable or just the moody and you just, oh, God. <laughs> you got to. So you, you can't. Like, well, I'll give you a case in point. Like I went to, I went to get a, a, a haircut and you needed a trim, right? So I went into Happy Cuts or whatever the hell it was. <laughs> And the, the gal says, uh, what's your phone number? And I said, oh, no phone number. I just, I just want to trim. She says, we need your phone number. And I said, you need my phone number? Why do you, do, what's your phone number? Oh, I can't, I'm not giving you my phone number. I'm like, well, why do I have to give you my phone number? But, but you don't, you don't, why is my right to privacy not respected? But I mean, it, was, it wasn't that big, but it was like, what are you talking about? And she says, well, you know, so all of a sudden now happy cuts, you get your beauty diploma. And now you're tracking human beings for the CDC, you know? Anyway, all I'm saying is that I was like, you know what? Never mind. I, I don't need the cut then if you need my phone number. But when I walk, anybody else would have just been a dick or a jerk or whatever. But when I walk out, it's like, it wasn't that Major Davis. That guy, Major Davis is a jerk off. It's not, hey, that anonymous human being was a dick. It's like, hey, the guy who played John Pope was in here and he was a total asshole. So they're yeah. just two completely different things. You know what I mean? So it's, uh, and I don't like it. I don't like it. You know, and, and the opposite is just as bad when somebody meets you and if they don't know who you are, that's honest. And they're either going to like you or not like you. And that's mm -hmm. straight up. But if they, if they're all of a sudden they're super happy and nice to see it because you're on a TV show, it's just as bad. I don't want anything and I don't want anything taken away. I just want to kind of just be invisible, you know? Yeah. William Shatner said one time, you know, the contract that he made with society for better or for worse is that his success at Captain Kirk meant that he had forfeited his privacy and become a public utility. Wow. 
And it's just not like, yet. It's interesting. Yeah, I didn't say persona or celebrity utility, man. Yeah. You become a tool. Where it's like, you know, you're sitting eating out and you're more or less by default expected to be pleasant with other people and to and to autograph things for them and to take pictures with them. Almost like our mindset is like by default, that's just normal. You know, oh, you see a celebrity. Oh, well, you know, yeah. I know them. I've watched them on TV, you know, and they'll be happy to take some of their precious time for me. It's not I will always say this, the case. Though, but David, I have to say this, though. It makes you a better person. It does. It's you don't want it. You didn't necessarily ask for it. Mm. Then again, look, I'm not getting bombarded. I don't have people, you know, swinging in through the roof you know, or stalking or going through my garbage. Thank God, you know, but, uh, but if, if, if something makes you, you know, have to take a, a step up uh, to, to project a little bit more optimism and positivity, you know, then all the better, you know, especially around kids or whatever, man, you gotta, you gotta project that too. So it's, it's, it's a good thing. I'm going to say it's a good thing. You were a guidance counselor for yeah. a while for at risk teens. Um, yeah. Did that I'll change you, you at all? You know what's weird? Look, I, I worked for a company. Yeah. And we were out in the desert and we basically took inner city gang kids that were of threat to, to a bad lifestyle or, or to God knows what else uh, in the inner cities. And we basically took them out in the middle of the desert and we and they got around horses and livestock and we all slept. We slept in teepees and we would move and we would we would do all this stuff. But it was all it was bloods and crips and the sudanios and the Northanios and all the ms-13 guys and but young young they weren't hardened people yet and the aryans and the samoans and you know just again the usual crap right so and it was a it was an incredibly rewarding thing um and it's weird because because every day i was there all i could think about was getting the hell out of it and for at least a good five, six years after I left, all I could think about was going back. It was one of those uh, experiences where everything you do has consequence, everything. There is no downtime, there's no filler, there's no in between. Everything you do, everything you say is a domino. That's intense. It has tremendous consequence and the stakes are extremely high. So it was a, it was a trip. And then, you know, and, and there were kids, a lot of times there were kids and a lot of times they, they got in the system. They'd done some pretty nasty stuff three days before their 18th birthday. Mm -hmm. And we kept those kids away from the kids because they weren't, they were, they were pretty hardened dudes, but for the most part, they were, uh, they were good kids, man. They really, really would. And they, and they, their parents would come or somebody would come to visit and then they'd long for home and then they'd run. They literally take off and you'd see a little yellow or a little red shirt, you know, heading off like a gazelle into the desert, into the desert. And there's nowhere to go. The nearest town would be 30, 30 miles, 26 miles away. Yeah. They're cut and off. It, yeah. It would be weird. And you, you, you chase them. And after a while, it was like, all right, who's going to go? Who's going to go? It's, it's like, well, you're closest. It's like, oh God, I'm already tired out from the other, from Thursday. And it'd be a trip. Cause you, you go now you're running. And all you hear is just the, your feet scrunching on the, on the dirt and you're chasing a t-shirt and you're screaming, just stop, you know, and they're screaming back. No, you're going to take me back. It's like, no, I'm not going to take you back. Just, just stop. Just stop. I'm getting tired, man. You're, you're driving me crazy. You know, I'm getting tired of you. So, so <laughs> you're going to take, no. And you convince the kid while you're shouting a hundred yards away, 50 yards away. Cause you're gaining on them or yeah. whatever. And they just, and then they get tired and it's like, I'm not going to do nothing. And you'd literally just show up and you'd sit with the kid and he'd tell you about, you know, a letter he got is his girlfriend seeing someone else or broke up with him or his mom's whatever's going on. Dad beat up mom again. It was all that kind of domestic yeah. shit. It's awful. And, uh, and then you'd say, Hey man, you want to go? It's there it is. But all you got to do is come back here. And if you can just finish up, three more months, if you can knock out another 12 weeks and I'll help you, you know what I mean? And were you gonna put this down on the record? No, we're not gonna put anything down on the record. I promised you nothing will go into your file and nothing ever did. It was 
you know, man on man kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and after the conversation, you'd get up and you'd leave the kid. Hey man, what am I going to do? Grab you by the hair. That's not how life works. It's, it's, you got to volunteer to, you got to warrior up and you're going to, you're going to come back. You're going to stand tall and face it. Or you're going to go off into, into chaos, into nowheresville, you know? So, so I, I remember these moments. There were a few, there weren't many. I wasn't doing it all the time, but being out there in the middle of nowhere, you're surrounded by saguaro cactuses or yucca or whatever. And there's beetles walking across the dirt and you're having a conversation with some, you know, young Hispanic kid who's, who's, who's pondering the rest of his life and, and, and what it's going to be. And it's, it's scary stuff, you know? So it's a hell of a lot different from munching some crackers at the craft service table over at MGM. You know what I mean? <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? You know? No, I hear you. Absolutely. You were in um, 15 episodes of SG one, an episode of Atlantis. You were in continuum for a cameo. Um, what, I, what a stretch of time, you know, and you were mainly there to, to facilitate the plot. Um, like to go with Daniel to Russia or, you know, to, to try and not crash a gold mothership into the, the Arctic sea. Um, what was it like playing that character? Well, I'll tell you when, when you describe it and you say 15 of this and blah, 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 blah. The, the, the thing that I flash back to is I never, I never felt comfortable. And what I mean by that is I never expected to come back. And I've told this story before. I never learned anybody's name until I'd done like nine years worth because it, by then it was getting stupid. But <laughs> the first time I, the first time I got on the show, um, I thought, well, they're never, they're not going to have me back. I mean, they're just not, you're an actor and to book a job is rare. And anyway, and then they, they did. And it was like, wow, well, that's not going to happen again. I mean, lucky too. So I just, instead I focused on the work, I guess is what I did. I focused on the lines, I focused on the scene, I focused on as much as I could to take advantage of what what little I had or as much as I had, but I didn't. Like it didn't, everybody knew my name after nine years, man. And I'm like, okay, you better start learning people's names because you've been on the show for 10 years, <laughs> you know? So, and I, and I sort of got, it's not like I was aloof or I had attitude. I just never thought I'd be back. Especially after you've done 10. Well, that's it. Like that was, then you just regret not learning anybody's name. And then there's five more to come. So, so that was, that was a trip. But look, it was just, what was your question again, David? I'm losing track. What was it like? What was it like playing Paul and, you know, playing a pen well, Pentagon was, it, pencil pusher who no, was always was, you know, getting himself into weird situations, getting duplicated by an alien, you know, it, weird things like that. No, I, I think, I don't know whose idea it was but it, it was probably just direction from from martin or 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 peter or somebody saying don't don't play him with the the, the twirling mustache don't play him bad because we had that with the other character oh with um, mayborn so, yeah yeah so just play yeah. him play him as a guy that's that sees the logic like he sees what should be done but he's got his orders too and yeah. kind of try and show a bit of that oh god yeah i know you're right but you, you can't do that because i've got orders and it's not going to happen so it's just humanize them a little bit which again is is just the the sophistication of the of, of the show you know so I, I, I that idea was probably given to me and i thought hey that's a great idea and i and i like that um because it's a very straight character for me you know it wasn't john pope or or mm. or julian slink from falling skies or any of this this crazy character stuff, which I love to do because I love to disappear. So there was less to hide behind with, um, with, 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 with major Davis, you know, but I remember, you know, trying to take it as serious as I can, as I could and respectfully, you know, making sure that I knew what, what each badge was, if I was going to wear one or the medals, I should say. And, um, he was, you know, kind of, yeah. So I kind of, you know, I want to say I got into it, but I wanted to, I mean, if you're going to stand there in uniform, man, you know, those are big shoes to fill, right? So. Did you know Peter DeLuise before? Um, no. Before you got, no. okay. <laughs> I, I was like under the impression that he had, that he had convinced you to, to try out. No, no, part. no, but I do, but I do have a Peter story. Okay. Um, I met Peter before Peter met me. I was an, I was a waiter 
at a restaurant called uh, Wule Oak, which was a Korean barbecue place on, I believe it was La Cienega in Hollywood. And Peter came in one day with a girl, I don't know, his wife or whoever it was at the time, or his girlfriend at the time. And we're talking, going way back, mm -hmm. man, way back. This has got to be 1989, 90, okay. something like that. Anyway, so I remember recognizing him. I'm like, oh, wow, that's that's Peter DeLuise. Because I was a huge fan of his dad. I'm still a huge fan of his dad. Yeah. Out of all the DeLuise's, man, is just great. Dom is just the badass, right? <laughs> so, but anyway, but I remember, I remember, and this is going to sound so cheap and silly, but this is why I remember it. Because it was, I was serving a celebrity. And I remember they were discussing whatever they were discussing. And I remember the tip went down. And I was like, oh, hey, that's, that's a pretty good tip. Uh, and I thought, awesome, that's great. And then... I went away and then they split and I came back. And when I came back, the tip had been reduced. <laughs> so the tip was like half of what, of what they'd originally put down, you know? So I often joke that, uh, that Peter DeLuise stiffed me, you know, at, at the, the Korean barbecue restaurant, but what a guy, man, what, what a guy, him and Anne Marie and uh, yeah. Peter, Peter's just, uh, I don't know. Maybe I think it's a DeLuise thing. There's a, there really is. There's, there's a magic around those guys. And, and I have to yeah. assume it came from their parents, you know, that they had wonderful parents that celebrated humor and laughter. And I mean, Peter will tell you, you know, just sitting around the table sometimes and the stories that uh, that are told within that that house. And it, it, it's, it, it just sounds like a lot of a lot of fun. So I've, I've got great respect and admiration uh, for him as a, as a human being, but also just I don't know, just the, the energy that, that they all represent. I think it's wonderful. Absolutely. Do you have any particular memories of, of working with that cast on SG-1 that stand out over the years? The first thing that pops to mind, and I may be exaggerating the story a little mm. bit, but boy, it sure felt like this. Um, I don't know what the hell it was with me. I was having a hell of a time remembering my lines. I was just, I think I hadn't done it in a while. I hadn't been on Stargate in a while. And then I realized what I was a part of. Anyway, I was nervous as all hell. And, um, Totally nervous. I had, I had to recite out, put it, and it was the scene was my, myself, Amanda, and I forget who else. Um, anyway, I totally was not getting it, and I was starting to get self conscious. But then Amanda like totally screwed up her lines, and I'm like, oh, okay, that's that's cool. And, and it it kind of relaxed me a little bit, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, we, everybody here's kind of screwing up a little bit, and I was settled down enough to get through it, and it was all good. And it wasn't until later that I realized. Amanda never screws up her lines. So, and if she did, it was extremely rare. And I thought she did that for me. She did it for me. Now she may not have, but that's how I choose to remember. <laughs> Cause she screwed up a couple of times and Amanda doesn't, she didn't screw up, man. She, she's, well, she's brilliant and, and all that kind of stuff. But I just thought it was an incredibly uh, gracious and generous thing to do. Um, to put another actor at ease and that's to blow a take and it just says hey man we're all human we're all here doing it and it did it put me at ease and and off and forward i went so so i don't look all of my stories are all positive which may sound a bit silly because life isn't positive and people aren't always positive and i'll bet you there were some serious battles on that show and stories that nobody's ever told you i don't know what they are though because i never saw them man they they kept it <laughs> They kept it private. They kept it in the corners where it belongs. And I mean, I've been on some sets, man. I've seen chairs thrown. I've seen some crazy shit go down. I didn't see that on Stargate. And, and if there was tension, nobody was, nobody was, I don't know. It just, uh, it, it, it never got, it never got to the point where it, 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 it affected things. Not for me anyway. It was, it was a, it's always a wonderful place to show up and work. Mm. I'm looking at uh, some of your other projects this blood drive series i've not mm. seen it um <laughs> and it looks like your character with the with the hat and everything else i mean you know this is this this julian slink character tell me about this guy this looks like a fascinating character wow it was what a blessing an absolute blessing uh blood drive is basically look it's not for everyone but if you <laughs> if you if you it's basically a post apocalyptic uh death race where the cars run on human blood and that's it and that's the show Jeez. then there's a show within the show called blood drive which is the show 
that puts this race on Got every it. week and how and 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 it's everything from what the network brass want we need more death we need more dismemberment there's not enough blood you know it to and and julian slink is the ringmaster kind of the barnum and bailey uh centerpiece for the show Got it. and but he's also has to deal with these these crazy suits you know in the corporate brass and what they need and offering him notes when he fancies himself as an artist when in fact he's a clone of like an android it's so funny <laughs> it's absolutely wacko but it's uh it, it's it's a trip what what it what i loved about it I think I was telling you this earlier on. It was an absolutely, utterly ridiculous premise for a show. You know, cars that run on human blood, and it's definitely not something that you would ever take seriously. Mm. I made the choice as an actor to do it like I was doing Arthur Miller, like this was like this was Eugene O'Neill, yeah. like I was doing Long Day's Journey and Tonight every single day. I took it as serious as I could, as I've ever taken anything in my life as an actor. It also, the timing was really interesting, David, in that I'd recently broken up with, in a relationship that was in for six, seven years and took a, a year or so to just kind of just get my bearings. And then this was an audition that came up and I got it. And I guess the question I had to myself was how good can you be? Like in all humility, as you're an actor, yeah. you fancy yourself an actor. And how good can you be? Because right now you're not in the middle of a crappy relationship that's, that's sucking up all your time and exhausting you. And also on the other foot, you're not madly in love with somebody who's sucking up all your time. So the fact that it's shot in South Africa, I wasn't on the phone, I miss you, I love you, come to, come to Cape Town, come to South Africa, there was none of that. Instead where I was living, and I didn't even know what the set would look like, I would, I would position everything I thought maybe that the scene might be like, because I wasn't the lead in the show. I got maybe mm -hmm. one, two takes and that was it. And then goodbye. Right. So all I did was I studied all of the live television from the fifties, all the Colgate theaters, the Westinghouses, everything Rod Serling made pre twilight zone, incredible pieces of work. And you were live. There was no videotape then. It was kinescope. Well, there, were, there was video in the air, like a telephone, excuse me. And what they do is they literally just take a film camera and they would film a monitor. They'd film a television. And that's how they saved it. Cause there was no such thing as videotape or audio tape like, right. or videotape anyway. Um, so I thought I'm only gonna get one or two shots at this. And these actors doing these shows would go live to the entire nation, to anybody with a television and the stakes, man, Talk about pressure, because if you blew it, you blew it in front of tens of millions of people. Your career was over, man. You were done. That's it. It was no go back, uh, cut, cut. Now I got to do it again. And it was an incredible time. It's one of my favorite uh, eras of acting mm. because you had to exit one door, then race your ass down the studio, put on a different wardrobe, hop in there, get to your mark and pray to God you got there before the camera. Otherwise the camera's gonna see you lumbering, flumping through the door. And <laughs> it's so totally like living hell stuff. But, and not, not many of them did, were, were very good, let alone great, but boy, there were a couple of gems there, man. You check out, for anybody that's interested, um, check out the comedian. Rod Serling's the comedian with Mickey Rooney. Uh, John Frankenheimer directed it. Martin Manuel's produced it. It's phenomenal. Okay. There's also a town has turned to dust. Again, Rod Serling. Study the history of that before you even see that and the censorship and what I think it was, I forget it was CBS was going to censor it because it was about a, a black kid who got lynched and they totally changed it and they made it, made it about a Mexican kid on a border town and, and they changed it and Serling was infuriated, man, apoplectic that they would screw with his work. But then look what they did. Look what they did when they did it. Because they know that they're being censored and there's some moments in there that, that are, okay. oh, it's so, so good. Anyway, so, so some great, great stuff like that. I would, I would check out and I would watch and, and then come back to blood, to blood to the show. <laughs> 
about an inter intercontinental blood race and uh and then do it you know so i don't know if i did any good i don't know if the show but it tried man i gotta hand it to dave david Strayton and uh and and james Rowland, the, the creator of the show it's it's wacko there's never been a show attempted like it and i gotta tip my hat to to sci-fi because they actually bankrolled this thing and it, it it is man it's batshit wacko it's crazy it's really really okay. crazy sometimes it's they push the envelope a little bit too much in some places but other parts are just absolutely divine. I'm going to check anyway, it out. I want to see it. I appreciate Sorry. it. Go ahead, David. I got uh, a few fan questions before I let you go. Is that okay? Hey, hey. <laughs> Adam Parra wants to know, can you tell a funny sky story? A funny falling sky story? Man, I flubbed that. A funny falling sky story. The things that come up right now, I don't know if you can see that. But I've got a scar. Ah, it's too shadowy. I've got a big old slice on my finger, and that's my falling skies scar. And uh, I was jumping over a thing, and I hit, I hit Sarah Carter's M16, and just boom, exploded it. And I knew because it was instantly warm, really warm and wet. And I thought that's not good. And I remember pinching my thumb so hard because I know that's bad, man, yeah. and just put it put it down and, and went on with the scene. I know that wasn't so much fun, but it reminds me of when, uh, oh God, Rambo, the Rambo movie when, uh, oh God, was the, the guy who played the sheriff. One of my, uh, uh, Denny. I seen it. Okay. You haven't seen Rambo? Oh, dude, you gotta, you gotta check out Rambo. <laughs> okay, I but will. I Brian, promise. Brian Denny, he pulls uh, Rambo's knife out from behind him and on the take, he, he, he opens his hand up bad. He man. actually did it. Yeah, he did. Because that thing was so sharp. Stallone was crazy with the sharp knife thing. And wow. Denny just opened it up, man. And oh, went on man. with the with the scene. I don't know how many stitches it took, but they had to stop production and everything. Because he just ripped his hand right over. Anyway, so I remember that from Falling Skies. I love Falling Skies, man. I miss Falling Skies. Falling Skies, again, really tried. They really did. The first two seasons, man, and not that they, they, they got it, you know, they nailed 100% of it, but boy, they really, really uh, tried. They really wanted it to be something good. And I think, though, we ended up with six showrunners, six head writers in five years, which is never a healthy thing. And, and things went the way they went. But I, I've said this before, I'll say it again. Noah Wiley is the most professional, most generous actor, one of the most, for, for sure, that I've ever worked with, man. He was, uh, I learned a lot from that guy. I really did. Wow. Michelle Palmer. Uh, so you, the, your last appearance uh, was actually in Atlantis. Was the atmosphere uh, uh, on Atlantis any different than it was on SG-1, despite the fact that it was still the SG-1 set and you were actually you in know the what? control room? I'm going to say yes, it was. Room? I'm going to say yes, it was. Um, and not for any fault or, or, or blame or anything like that. It's just the magic of that original cast was the magic of that original cast. And, and the magic that was those characters was also reflected in, in, the, in the crew around them. They, were, they, were, they really were a, a tight knit group. I mean, they, were, they, they go out and have beers together and play mm. softball together and they really, really were. So, and I think by, by then there, there'd been a few changes and there'd been, you know, and again, everybody was doing great and still having a great time but they'd also been doing it for a while. So it's not like, you know, you're part of that three year period with the Yankees, you know, or with the Pittsburgh Steelers, you know what I mean? It's still a great team, but Lynn Swan's not catching the balls. Anymore, you know? it's, just, <laughs> it's just, it's just different. It was just, just different, you know, but yeah. it was, uh, but look, Hey man, even a bad day on Stargate's better than a great day fishing, right? Uh, Jack would disagree, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Martin Mullet, uh, more Molit. Colin, is it more fun playing the good guy or the bad guy? They're the same guy. They're the same guy. Yeah. They really are. They're the same guy. They're just the good guy. Uh, people think they know, and the bad guy, people think they don't know. You know, so it's 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 they're both the same guy. They're the same guy. They're just they're one's a little more misunderstood than the other. 
that's that's an interesting point. I'm going to have to ponder that for a while. That's pretty deep. Andrew P., uh, what did you think of uh, the writing on Stargate? Again, I think that's what, at the end of the day, would, would, what really held it up um, was the writing. So it's, it's Joe and Brad Wright and, and those guys, man. They really, I don't know how they kept doing it. Look, cause it, I it's, don't either. It, 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 I really don't. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a break, Breaking Bad fan. Yeah. And, and I, it's that kind of a thing. When you see something that, 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 that's so good for so long, mm-hmm. it, man, it's, it, it, it becomes, it's not even the point where it's, it's unique or that it's an anomaly. It's just not possible. You start thinking there's some kind of divine intervention that's coming in. It, 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 I think it's just the wheels of the universe, man, the wheels of the Stargate universe. And just and there's hundreds of billions of them, and they all just sometimes just come together. Into place. And, then, and then they don't anymore. You know what I mean? So if you happen to be riding one of those cogs as the mechanism's moving, you get to have these wonderful experiences. And fortunately, with videotape and with, uh, with film or what have you, you can you can replay it, and and the magic's still there. At least I hope it is. I hope it's not all nostalgic. I mean, obviously, look, you and I are sitting here talking because there's there's fans, and we're you know maybe you know way back when what was your favorite memory and all that kind of stuff. So I don't want to. I hope we're not coming off as a couple of old farts, you know, <laughs> lamenting I think so. lamenting getting older, you know. But um, <laughs> but it but it's like I said, it's nice to hear if you're if if, if there's new fans that are coming aboard and discovering yeah. it. They're not discovering something different. They're discovering what we discovered too. You know, or anybody that watches it, they're gonna discover the same thing. So it's not, it's nice that it's not generational. It's, it's discovery. It's like, hey, this is good. This is smart. It doesn't talk to me like I'm stupid. And, um, and, it, and it allows me to enjoy the ride, but also reach for something a little, a little maybe smarter than myself, you know? It's so fair. That's, yeah, you know? Rebecca Frost, is it, do you think, the central reason for today's cancel culture that we preach putting self first now as opposed to putting self last? Who said it again? Is it, uh, Rebecca Frost wanted to know, is it, do you think the central reason for today's se- uh, cancel culture is that we preach putting self first now as opposed to putting self last? Uh, yes, but I think if you dig deeper than that, there's, there's a lot more going on. It, 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 I mean, this is a big subject, but and you're going to attack it from every dynamic, every demographic. I think maybe psychologically, emotionally, um, a lot of times people will want to cancel things they're either scared of or they're envious of or they want to control. And where do those things come from? Obviously, some measure of unhappiness. I'm not happy and I don't like the fact that you are. I don't, yeah. I don't like, I'm, I'm discontented. Therefore you can't, you, you cannot be content or anything for that matter. <laughs> I'm discontented. <laughs> therefore your existence is offensive uh, to a degree. And again, I'm not, I'm not just want to slap on a big bump. No, 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 I understand. But, but yeah, if, if you can't, if you got to cancel something, if that's, if that's your, if that's the way you articulate your point of view, it's, you've lost. That's, that's not a debate. That's, uh, you know, I mean, cause look, cancel, to cancel something, the way it's, the way it's being applied today, it's, uh, if anything, I mean, and I mean this, and I mean this with all sincerity, that this conversation about Stargate could be dangerous. Who's to say that in five, 10 years from now, well, were you not on that show? David, did you not support that show? Well, we see you've interviewed all these actors on that show. Whereas now that show Stargate is seen seen as this, and this is not very good today. So you know all the episodes have been banned, David. And you've kind of gone underground. Your Twitter account's been frozen and your Facebook's been deleted. What do you have to oh, say for yourself? If only. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, but no, I hear you. No, I hear you. I hear what yeah, you're saying. So I'm, I'm just, I don't know what, what's going to be. What's next? You know, yeah. 
what's next? It's terrible. You can't, and you can't just enjoy being a human being anymore. I can't talk about sports because sports is now politics. I can't say beautiful. I can't talk. We can't talk about the weather because the weather is now politics. Yeah. I can't have a waffle and just enjoy a, some friggin' syrup without offending diabetics sitting at the next table. I mean, I just want to just have a waffle, you know? And so to constantly be bombarded and reminded and, and to be sensitive to and respectful of, and sometimes you just want to, you, I'm going nuts. I just, I just want to just be cool. I want to go to the beach and play guitar. I, I, I'm sorry I don't have a permit to do it, officer. You know what I mean? Can I not just sit in the sand and play a song, you know, or, or whatever? I don't know. You know what I'm saying? So I do. it's where you, you don't know what to do or what to say anymore. And it's, it's such a shame. It's such a shame. Another thing, interesting point, like I was at a, a, did a film festival here Horrorscape International here in St. George, Utah. And we did, uh, there was a, a, a Q&A &A and a, a bit of a, a talk afterwards. And it was interesting because I had to really watch what I was gonna say, not so much because it was a PC thing, but because you're being recorded. So if I'm talking to some young actors, if I know people don't have their phones out, if I know I'm not being videotaped, I will tell you more. I will tell you much more. I will tell you things that can be of great benefit to you. I will tell you tricks. I will tell you things to watch out for. I will tell you better ways of doing things. Don't, and I'll tell you things not to worry about. These are not things I can get into if every single thing I say is gonna be uploaded. And documented for all time. And documented for all time. Because yeah. number one, I mean, you, you, you just can't. You just can't. So. And that's where people are getting their information now. That's how they get their information. And they're what they're when you go online, you are looking for censored info because that's all you're going to get, man. At least that's all you're going to get from me. Mm -hmm. I got to be careful. It's almost like, look, if I'm giving a lecture and if, if I was giving up my lecture and I had students come to my my studio, it's going to be a completely different lecture than if I'm invited out to UCLA or USC and I'm now standing in an academic, in the world of academia, because if I say something inappropriate, whoever hired me is gone, man. They're fired, I'm fired. So it's all about being safe. It's all about saying the right things, feeling the right things, expressing the right things, being sensitive to the right things. And if you're focused on that, how the hell can you teach young people how, how to prepare themselves for the world? So it's uh, it's interesting. So because there's so much that an actor, well, that I have, I've been incredibly blessed, man. I've worked with Spielberg. I've worked with some of the greats, and I can't share. I can only tell you that everybody's wonderful. Everybody's great. We all had a great time, and it was a laugh a minute. And but nothing was learned, and there were never any challenges, and there was no way, no need to get through them because nothing wrong ever happened. Well. I mean, if that's if if that's the direction that we're going, you know, and it's entirely possible. Um, well, I'm just saying for, for me when I'm yeah, when I'm invited, yeah, yeah, when I'm invited to 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 speak, it it I'm not I'm no longer focused on what I have to say. Right. I'm now focused on who hired me, you know, and 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 so you you it's it's it can it sometimes it gets reduced to just pablum to this uh, disposable styrofoam cup, anecdotal. Well, you have to protect yourself, you know. I mean, this is a different world that we live in, and it has been since this thing came online the past several years called YouTube, where everything is there for all time. And we can go back and look and and see what people said 10, 15 years ago and, and take action based on how things are now. But uh, at the same time, I have hope. So Me too. You've got Me to. Too. Yeah. So. Uh, so, uh, last question for you. Uh, Teresa McAllister and Michael uh, wanted to know, uh, Brad Wright is uh, working uh, on trying to get a fourth Stargate series off the ground. Uh, would you be interested in being in the new show and uh, potentially leading a, a team through the Stargate of your own? Nah. <laughs> Why would I want to do that? Hell <laughs> yes! Oh, my God. Look, I you know, I have to say, though, I mean... First off, I really hope that happens. That'd be so great, wouldn't SG4. it? SG4, you know, I'm it, pushing it, for it. Yeah, and it's time. I really think that it, it would be so. great. I, yeah, I think so too. Um, 
I, I think I'd be on a very, very long, I'd be at the bottom of a very long list in terms of who they would bring out to, uh, to invite to come, come out there. But, but you bet, man, sure. Because now I, now I know what it is. So I, I think any actor that they brought back from, from SG1, it'd be hard to direct them because they'd just be smiling the whole time. <laughs> they'd be just happy you know, to be there. Be like, this is okay. <laughs> you know? Well, it's, I'll, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Stargate's chicken soup and we could really use some chicken soup. Yeah, so. no, that, that's, that's, a, that's a good way to put it. My friend, it has been a pleasure. I, I we went a little bit over time with you. I appreciate you taking the time that you, that you did. And um, it's fantastic to see you. And um, it's just, I, I really, th th this week was going to be rough for, for us, everybody, you know, and I, I put you here on the calendar this weekend because I, you know, I, I knew that you would have some, some interesting and insightful things to say, and I wanted to see a friendly face. So I appreciate you taking the time. Hey, thank you, David. Thank you everybody for writing in your questions. And, uh, Hey, look, all I can say is after all this time, it's just all gratitude. Thank you so much. You know, thanks for keeping it all going. It's not just me and Major Davis and stuff, but we, we know what we all belong to. And it's uh, it's pretty cool, man. Like, wow, how cool is that? So, yeah, chicken soup with, uh, with chocolate ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> One after the other, not at the same time. Colin. Thank you, David. Thank all you very best. much. David. You take care thank of yourself, you. brother. Bye-bye. <laughs> Colin Cunningham, Major Davis, everyone. All right. I do have a couple of questions from the floor that were given to me. John42, hi, David. Could you play some appropriate Stargate elevator music while we wait? Um, so on that, that would be a copyright violation as far as I am aware. Uh, I would not have a problem with reaching out to Mr. Neil Acri and seeing if, you know, at some point he has some time to, to write... Uh, some loops there for the beginning of the show. Uh, that's that's something that that I've considered, but it, it would have to be original original music. Jonathan Shar, thank you, David, for keeping the Stargate dream alive. You're welcome, absolutely. Any chance you or the crew could read some fan fiction as a charity franchise awareness raising event? Be glad to help out. Email me. Dave, um, <laughs> I almost gave my personal email address. Uh, Dial the gate show at gmail .com. In fact, let me get that. Uh, that on the screen here and we can we can talk about that as we wrap up all right if you like what you've seen in this episode i would appreciate it if you'd click the like button it really makes a difference with youtube's algorithm and it will definitely help the show grow its audience please also consider sharing this video with a stargate friend and if you want to get notified about future episodes click the subscribe icon if you plan to watch live, I recommend giving the bell icon a click so you'll be the first to know of any schedule changes, which will probably happen all the time. And bear in mind, clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next several days on, at the very least, the GateWorld.net uh, YouTube channel. Hopefully, uh, dial the gates as as well. One of the things that have kind of surprised me, I, I was planning on doing a lot more... Um, uh, clips when we first started the show, uh, week to week stuff to keep the to keep the channel alive as it were, and that's time consuming. So I did not expect that to be the case. If anyone out there wants to help me with um, with farming the clips and uh, getting them up on the on the site, I may have some work for you there. So I do appreciate uh, everyone who has tuned in uh, for Colin. Thank you to Summer, Ian, Tracy, and Keith, and Jeremy. You guys are fantastic moderators. Could not do this without you. Big thanks to Jennifer and Linda, the Gate Gabber, my production assistants. We have a lot of cool stuff heading your way. Neil Acri is coming up this afternoon. Let me double check the time for everyone before I let you all go. Neil Acri is going to be on at 3 p.m. Pacific time, 6 p.m. Eastern. That's all I've got for you guys right now. I really appreciate you tuning in. And uh, you know what? We'll be back in a couple more hours here uh, with more Dial the Gate fun. I'm David Reed, and I'll see you on the other side.